Good evening, and welcome to our continuing series, Explorations in Savagery, with our brother Alok. Namaste. We are still in Canto 11, <coughs> Book 2, the book of the Traveler of the Worlds, the Kingdoms and Godheads of the Greater Mind. And we are on page 272, about eight lines from the bottom. This greater truth is foreign to our thoughts. So as we can see, we are climbing the stairway of thought. And thought in the mystic sense is a vehicle. So we'll see that as we grow and evolve, one of the things that begins to change is the nature of thoughts. And it becomes a vehicle to take us to the next level, to the next level, to the next level. And that's what is being described here. Yes. Till we reach a point where this vehicle has to be discarded. Then you enter into that state which is the silence, first the silent self, the self of mind, and then the silence of the unknowable. So this is the vehicle and it begins to change uh, from a you know, bus full of all kinds of crowd to a more sophisticated bus, car, aircraft, rocket, <laughs> jet, <laughs> satellite. Actually, these are images one can see in visions and dreams. So it's not just a joking deal. Like ancient rishis, they would see other images, but modern uh, times we will see another kind of image like if you see an image of a satellite in which you are traveling so it is like you are into a thought which takes us beyond the boundaries of the earth into the vast uh, into the vastness of the cosmic being so that's how it will be or if you see an aircraft so you are still somewhere you know hovering a little above earth in the higher mind probably but the train is still popular the train is still popular <laughs> yes the train is about the journey Right. More than the vehicle, it's the journey. So, you know, missing a train, changing tracks. So, it's very interesting. It's a whole world. So, thought is a vehicle. And we, have re we had read last time. I'll start from a few lines from above. But hidden, but denied to mortal grasp. Mystic, ineffable is the spirit's truth. Unspoken, caught only by the spirit's eye. There's no way you can... Convince the mind caught in the grip of, now Shubhendu is using the word mortal grasp. It doesn't mean those who are in intuitive mind are physically immortal. But they have started touching those realms of immortality where their mind can remain immortal for a long, long time and continue to influence earth. So that like Swami Vivekananda's mind, you know, thoroughly intuitive yes. mind. Yes. So he is using the word mortal grasp here in terms of that so how do we see it what is the condition required no amount of uh, breathing exercises pranayama sir sarshan is going to help here there is another asana which we have to do and that asana is the most difficult of all when naked of ego and mind it hears the voice it looks through light to ever greater light and sees eternity and sphering life. So it begins to uh, move into a more luminous realm and towards more and more light. The light continues to increase and then it sees that otherwise we see life and blank all around. We don't know what really surrounds it. But then it sees what surrounds time and the movement of time is the eternal. It begins to see eternity and sphering life. That's how the Vedic yes. mystics describe that Diti is surrounded by Aditi. The divided consciousness is ensphered by the undivided consciousness. This greater truth is foreign to our thoughts. And now comes some very marvelous lines which are completely shattering uh, in every sense. Yes. yes. Today only I remember I had an email exchange about the law of karma. So someone had asked but you know we are told about the law of karma, this way, that way. So I was writing what Shurbinder and Mother have said. It's essentially an 
law of evolution it's not a law of judgment and punitive measures <laughs> but a law of evolution so you grow uh, and through through constant learning experience and basically the reward and punishment aspect of karma is instantaneous but it's not a reward and punishment it's about you either blossom or you shrivel that's all and that cuts away the delight or opens you to delight so what about those things that this life you did something and that life it's the unfinished experiences we are on a learning curve we entered a classroom but we we needed more to learn from it to grow or to gain from that experience we couldn't so unfinished curves of evolution take place in another life and it's not about reward and punishment but in process of evolution so here we have this where a free wisdom works they seek for a rule so there has to be a rule and sometimes the rule are made so hard oh you lost this money because you must have lent it to someone so once long back i humorously asked i said so you mean it's we give back with interest or you know what <laughs> what is it about <laughs> but we want to because that's how our mind operates instead of letting our mind become like god's by with by process of identification and grace we try to reduce the mind of god to our own mind so he must be punishing he must be rewarding he must be doing this he must be doing that but the rules of religion have found, all, been found in all the religions same way. because otherwise they cannot operate see the moment you say freedom it is unnerving it can be devastating <laughs> like the sea swimming <laughs> you want the way there is no way there need not be a way you are being carried you know we always want a way where i do something then it's a way but where you are being carried through everything how do you you get it idea that this is way all right <laughs> divine allows you <laughs> i often give this example as i move down uh, if if at night you take a walk on the sea shore you'll see when you turn you know towards the sea uh, you have the moon beam falling now right up to the end you will feel the moon beam is falling right where you are walking so you think it's your path <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> you encounter those experiences but actually <laughs> it is the vast sea and rolling itself we can see only a small fragment we see this is the path but who knows uh, a lot more happens in everyday life than when we sit in meditation so those who sit in meditation and move through that they feel oh by meditation i had this but actually it is everyday events of life which are carrying us now this is one drop of sincerity yes. is worth more than meditation yes oceans of theories where a free wisdom works they seek for a rule or we only see a tripping game of chance because mm. then if we don't understand rule then it must be chance but there is something else the fancy the wonder of the mother's whims a wisdom which which does not depend on the rules of the game in fact there are no rules of the game the highest truth is this always you decide your mind fixes the rules so divine says okay i'll play according to this rule you believe that there is reward and punishment divine will meet you as a reward and punishment <laughs> you believe it is grace carrying you you will experience grace carrying you so it's amazing you know and very difficult for human mind to believe because it it always has learned that my efforts with the ego sense animals don't believe that but the mind and the ego sense believes it's me my efforts that's it it cannot imagine that grace can carry you through everything it's beyond its comprehension it will often call it laziness all kinds of things or a labor in chains forced by bound nature's law and absolutism of dumb unthinking power so these are the three things which human being say either that there is a spiritual energy and there is a cause and effect rules spiritual set of rules or you say it's chance it's random or you say that there is a mechanical energy which is operating and you are bound by its rules if you eat khatta you will have a sore throat that's how it is boils down to that but actually it's none of these but something else there is a logic in the infinite but a logic which human mind cannot comprehend with its limited vision and limited seeing 
And Sri Aurobindo uses effect mm. and cause. Yes. Not cause and effect. Yes. That reminds me of, you know, his little story. Because again, someone had asked me that if there is no such law of karma, why did Angad? Angad, you know, was Val Bali's son in Ramayana. And uh, it is said that he was the man who was reborn as the Vyad, the hunter, who mistakenly shot an arrow in Krishna's feet and therefore Krishna died. And the logic of it is traced back to this fact that Angad carried that resentment inside. And this was a way that that had to be the law of karma caught up even with Rama. So in as Krishna avatar, the arrow was shot. So it was like, what about my comment? So I said, for me, it's a very different story altogether. Yes, Angad carried some resentment, but we should not forget how the Lord would look at it. Now for the Lord, Angad is a faithful servant. The way he has served Lord Rama is amazing. Now in the entire Mahabharata, there is no entry of Angad. Such a wonderful person whom, you know, divine owes so much to him. So he says, okay, the last act of my drama, I will make you enter the scene. Now why I am saying is that why he becomes the last act? Because very often people say, oh, Krishna died after this arrow, but something else happened. And Sri Krishna gave him the charge of carrying his relics down the generations. Sri Krishna's relics are only at one place. I, I think people know about it. So, Angad turned Vyad in next life, shoots an arrow. Even his name is symbolic, Jara, old age. <laughs> if you want to look at it symbolically. And then, Sri Krishna says, you don't have to feel bad about it. Uh, when my body is given to ashes, you carry the relics and those relics are carried down the generations eventually enshrined in Jagannath Puri. That's how the whole story goes. That, so, you know, it's a grace. It's not like just an exhaustion of karma. Exhaustion of energy is one part, but there is something greater. So, you know, there are so many ways you can look at it when you look at it from the point of view of the grace. Audacious in their sense of God-born strength. These dare to grasp with their thought truths absolute. So this is the thought which is right into the apex. By an abstract purity of godless sight. Now what is this godless sight? See the gods invariably have an angle of vision. They are two good guys, you know, they are good guys. So they always have an angle of vision which eliminates the dark side of life. They cannot see it. So gods cannot understand why an asura is blessed by the Lord and lifted up. It's very difficult for the gods to comprehend that. <laughs> they don't know the game of transformation. They don't know that for the Divine Mother all our portions and aspects of herself. So this godless sight is a pure sight which is devoid of all these virtues, aspects, angles of vision, but something which sees the totality. That's, that's how it's a godless sight. Again, it comes by a percept nude, intolerant of forms. It will give a form of speech for expression, but it may be a very different form of speech the next moment. Sri Aurobindo says that what I say to X applies to X. What I say to Y mm. applies to Y. And even to them at different stages, he will say different things. That's why it's so difficult and, uh, you know, actually impossible in a certain sense to quote Sri Aurobindo and the mother. Unless you have read everything and, you know, got the drift of it, it can be so misleading. Because it's said in a certain context. So what is the way? Mother says, when you read my writings or, of course, Sri Aurobindo's writings, go behind the words and touch the state of consciousness. Now, if we touch that state of consciousness, the whole thing changes. But that comes either, you know, ultimately by grace. Then you see what Sri is writing in a letter is a very, very different thing than what appears from the words which are put into our head and mixed with our own limited understanding. Then it's a very, very different thing. I, I could give a number of examples. Uh, one of that, which someone was also again quoting some time back, uh, that... Yeah, there was also this, you know, aphorism, for example, mm. that do not listen to um, 
even God's luminous angels, which is so true. At one level, it's so true. Now, during that time, there are letters of like that when Shubhendra is written. Now, there he is very clearly marked out that don't let either a guru or somebody come between you, a angle of vision, half-hearted thing. At the same time, there is a paradox that within the ashram itself, the Divine Mother and Shurabindo made people write and speak on their behalf. So there is always a rule being overridden by another rule and that's not a rule but a grace which empowers human beings. That we will see here coming up in intuitive mind. There is something that can be empowered, empowered by the Divine Fiat. But at the same time in general, he would caution us not to do certain things. So, Especially to make a rule. Yes. They brought to mind what mind could never reach. So mind has to just open and receive. And then it will give form. And hope to conquer truth supernal base. A stripped imperative of conceptual phrase. Architectonic and inevitable. Translated the unthinkable into thought. So here thought is born almost, you know, out of that state of consciousness, which is in that vastness. Yes. And you cannot put it into any kind of uh, rigid form and make it a dogma. If you do that, then you are doing injustice. That's why Mother and Shubhindo's words should never be turned into, uh, they said this and quoted in this way. To turn them into rigid dogmas is to do great disservice. You have to just stay quiet and slowly the meaning will emerge. And it takes time. It's much deeper than what appears from the words or analysis of Especially words. Especially with savagery. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Architectonic. It's like the very beginning. Is Architectonic is like the base of architecture. Something from which all structures and forms have emerged. So it is that base where everything is ready. Just like a creative writer has like a creative enthusiasm. And then there is a concept, and then there is a perception, then there are words, thoughts, like that. A silver-winged fire of naked subtle sense. So not only thought, but even the senses undergo a transmutation. An ear of mind withdrawn from the outwards rhymes, discovered the seed sounds of the eternal word. Oh. So thus far, tantric uh, yoga and nad yoga goes. Intuitive mind. Most yogas that I am aware of, which take help of these seed sounds, go up to this state. They cannot climb beyond. Because then you have to drop the uh, that help. It's very difficult. <laughs> so they use a mantra or they use a... It's not mantra. This is about seed sounds. And using those seed sounds, they can climb up to there. That is the birthplace of these seed sounds. <clears throat> The rhythm and music heard that built the worlds and seized in things the bodiless will to be. So this uh, music that built the worlds uh, is called in Nad Yoga as Anahad Nad. Actually this Nad has, uh, there are two meanings to this. Uh, one is Anahad. So some people take it as a, you know, it's Anahat. Means you, unstruck sound, sound which emerges Without, otherwise for sound you need to strike against something. Or it is anhad. I prefer this understanding. Anhad means actually it is limitless. So out of the vast limitless, there is the first stir, the vibration which is emerging. And they touch that base. It is a very powerful, many ancient yogas, Sufi mystic yoga and uh, saints yoga, it follows this path. And reaches up to the intuitive mind. The illimitable they measured with numbers, rods and trays. The last formula of limited things. In transparent systems. Body termless truths. The timeless made accountable to time. And valued the incommensurable supreme. So everything as we have seen, is explained. But the difference is, in illumined mind, there are a number of conceptual phrases which will come to explain. Here, because it is going to the origin of thing, one sound, one formula, 
which will explain everything else. For example, Jagat Mithya Brahma Satya. Now this is one formula. How does it explain everything? All this is illusion. Now you don't have to actually explain anything. What has created it? Mind has created it. So it will be like that. Whereas if you go in the illumined mind, you will have gods, goddesses, each having a certain power. The yogis on those planes will operate in this way. To park and hedge the ungrasped infinitudes, they erected absolute walls of thought and speech and made a vacuum to hold the one. So that's how this world operates. And what is beyond it? Beyond it, it's a vacuum. There is nothingness. So you can call it nothingness or you can call it one. Depends upon the angle of vision. If you are a Buddhist nihilist, you will say nothingness or a Shaiva Tantra. Or if you are a classical Advaitin, you will say one, Ekame Viditya, of which nothing can be said. In their sight, they drove towards an empty peak, a mighty space of cold and sunlit air. Now it's very interesting why it is cold. You see, it's an impersonal truth. What is missing there is the heart of the Divine Mother. <laughs> that is a mystery. And Ashwapati will cross all these layers. And then we have the description, even as he stood on being's naked edge, that which he was seeking drew near. Yes. And then he describes the heart coming in. One came and she took into herself world and nature and soul. That you can't find here. So you have sunlight. But you have cold peak, austere peak. They miss out on love. Mother says several, several times why these yogis could not conceive of transformation is because they didn't have the power of transformation. They never knew what it is. It is love. Even those who went by Bhakti Marga, they stopped at a personal adoration of the deity. But the boundless love that works in creation, they could not find they were not keen to find. To unify their task, excluding life, which cannot bear the nakedness of the vast, they made a cipher of multitude. In negation found the meaning of the all and in nothingness the absolute positive. So on one side, Jagat Mithya and on other side, Ekam Evidhityam. So this was the perfect formula. But the moment you have to explain the world, they came back to the illumined mind. Gods, goddess, etc. Et but still the darkness, the evil cannot be understood. So they, they going still further down in the higher mind, there was a bright power and a dark power. Going still further down in the rational mind, well, it's all a game of chance. Going still further down, it's imagination. All these demons and angels. Going still further down, don't bother about all this. I have to bother about my everyday life physical mind but there is a step beyond it where you see the perfect synthesis and harmony that is missing there so but they have reached pretty high where single formula a single law simplest the cosmic theme compressing nature into a formula their titan labor made all knowledge one a mental algebra of the spirit's ways an abstract of the living divinity. You can't bind the Divine Mother to any rule or formula. But they made a living a formula of the living divinity. The moment you say ki everything is according to rule, then divinity is no more free. It is bound. So they bound everybody, including Krishna. There are scriptures which say Krishna is suffering in hell because of the Mahabharata war. So once somebody asked me, I said, yes, who else has the power and the capacity to go into hell? Hell is where you need sweetness and delight. So Krishna can go anywhere. It speaks highly of Krishna. <laughs> it's because human mind works like that. They have to suffer. They have to go through this. Because there is no other way you can explain. Even the Lord Jagannath's absence of... It's very silly. You see how scriptures and religion... If you see the idol of Lord Jagannath, Balbhadra and Subhadra, maybe you have noticed it's incomplete. Okay, it's 
so it is said that the hands and one of the theories hands and legs are uh, gone away because of the karma of their own karma so they have to you know mahabharata so they have to dissolve this is a very gory explanation uh, better explanation is it's an sign of an imperfection which is yet to be born that's a better explanation because you know the murtikar who is making the idol stops he has given that to the king don't be curious and try to intrude but he grows curious because months have gone by and one day he knocks at the door and vishwakarma vanishes so it is still imperfect because mental curiosity has intervened this is a better explanation and if you have to bring in karma then the lord jagannath is taking the whole world unto himself and it's not his karma but the karma of the entire all the energies of the creation that he is carrying within and leading it towards perfection so there are so many ways of looking at it but there is a tendency to bind to one formula their titan labor made all knowledge one a mental algebra of the spirit's ways an abstract of the living divinity here the mind's wisdom stopped mm. it felt complete mm. because it has arrived at the perfect formula of god <laughs> in present day for nothing more was left to think or know in a spiritual zero it sat throned and took its vast silence for the ineffable see this is important because several time i have had uh, interaction with people who were devotees of certain big saints i won't take the name but huge following and not one or two but quite a few i know and whenever they asked about transformation they drew a blank they would give some reason or the other that no this world is going on it will carry on like this forever and forever i have a very simple uh, re- uh, understanding about this because they don't know love they don't know the transforming power of love so it's not possible they know human love and all that which is a bondage and ignorance from which you have to emerge but they don't know that power of the mother's love so the whole thing moves within this spiritual zero this was the play of the bright gods of thought they are luminous beings no doubt attracting into time the timeless light imprisoning eternity in the hours so what it means imprisoning eternity in the hours there is a moment in which something happens or something takes place and we, our mind has a tendency to turn it into a formula for all times it's a very dangerous thing now i'll give you one example it's very interesting uh, i read vision of one of you know the lady who had started hablik i think it was her vision or it was Uh, Amal Kiran's wife. I may be mistaken. One of the two, but it's very interesting vision that uh, it's 1974 and they are going into mother's room, and suddenly they have vision of the divine mother. One of them, now, and the mother comes and says, because all this is going on inside that you know mother used to be there. Now you know she's not there in the room, and the mother comes and says. i am no more confined to my room i am everywhere you know some of these that she is spread out all around now it does not mean as the human mind would say that there is no importance of visiting the mother's room it doesn't mean that that's how the human mind will make another formula and try to <laughs> turn it into another narrow understanding yes. it means that this place because it contains her she has done her tapasya it contains those luminous those tremendous supramental vibrations which is what she spoke about samadhi the supramental vibrations are most intense here yeah. but at the same time we can't limit their working to a geographical space because she is working everywhere wherever there is an opening she is working and especially after 1956 yeah. but this has changed since the early days yeah what? in the early days dalini would say don't go out of the ashram yes so that's what i'm saying things change because they evolve now but we fix things in a certain which took place in a certain context of time that's what i meant that time trapping the time eternity into time yes at one place shubhendra says in uh, gita's introduction to gita which is originally in bengali translation is there in english 
He says that Sri Krishna created the Rastra, Bharat. And then he says if Sri Krishna were to come again, very interesting, where to come again, who knows? He will be on the side of a world unity. <laughs> so you can't go by Krishna in that avatar. This because many times people say second coming of Christ. So once I had this discussion written as short story also. I said if Christ came, will we recognize him? We'll expect him to speak Hebrew and to tell everybody, are you reading the Bible? <laughs> Probably he'll be happy if, if, we, if you said, Sir, I think the days of Bible are over. I want something else. <laughs> Who knows? Because he is not limited by a, an action in a certain period of time. We limit him. Yes. Yes. You know, he will not be, in, Sri Krishna will not necessarily wear dhoti. He may wear something else. Today's times, you know, times change, evolve. He may not use the peacock feather. Nowadays, animal activists will probably file a case <laughs> if they see Krishna with the peacock feather. So the Lord knows <laughs> somebody will file a court case. <laughs> so, catching eternity in time, but these gods do it. They fix it for all period of time. This they have planned to snare the feet of truth in an orient net of concept and of phrase and keep her captive for the thinker's joy in his little world built of immortal dreams. You see this thinker's joy. There are people in India I have seen who every day morning will religiously read a particular scripture. It's their <laughs> bread and butter. <laughs> but Maybe even <laughs> one seven hundredth of the sloka of the Gita, if they were to put into practice, life would be very different. Thinker's joy. That's why the Gita has given an antidote or rather a means to transcend itself. And Srimindu points that out in Essays on the Gita as well as in the synthesis of Yoga. In Essays on the Gita, he points out in every scripture there are temporal things and there are eternal truths. And synthesis, he says, ultimately you have to go beyond the word. Yes. And he quotes the Gita, Shabd Brahma Ati Vartate. What language does God speak? Why only Sanskrit? Why not Tamil? You know that story of Amrita? Somebody yes. told me. <laughs> <laughs> they were all gods. You know, Sanskrit, gods speak in Sanskrit. Samriddhi, no, no, you don't know the full truth. When they speak to human beings, they speak in Sanskrit. <laughs> Between themselves, they speak Tamil. <laughs> <laughs> it breaks your conceptions. Yeah. Or that little girl from Odisha who says, God knows Odisha, Odia. Why? Because whenever I pray in Odia, she answers. What language does God know? Is he a slave of language? Mother says, do you, do you think I have to learn Tamil now to understand? <laughs> so she knows the dumb heart of atom of flowers and everything. But this is the play of the thinker's joy. There must she dwell, mewed in the human mind. It's like another word for imprisonment in a certain sense. An empress, prisoner in her subject's house. Now you see some of the asuras who try to capture the powers of uh, the great goddess and keep her in their house. Even Ravana wanted Parvati and Shiva to come to Lanka and he said, I built a golden house for you. Because they want their, these powers to become captive. Adored and pure and still on his heart's throne, his splendid property, Cherished and apart in the wall of silence of his secret muse, immaculate in white virginity, the same forever and forever one is worshipped changeless goddess through all time. These are the ones who become cult leaders, a cult in the highest sense, not in the limited sense. They start sects and it is through them that you can approach. They have captured her within their own formulas. 
thus alone and not otherwise. That's how these sects thrive. And then he becomes an intercessor, not from thought point of view, but between the divinity and you. Just like symbolically in a temple, it is the priest. Here it becomes the master. They are great beings at intuitive mind, but still they are limited beings. The divine mother is still beyond. So it's a preparation for that. He is taking us toward that climax, which will come on next to next page. Or else a faithful consort of his mind, assenting to his nature and his will. She sanctions and inspires his words and acts, prolonging their resonance through the listening ears, companion and recorder of his march, crossing a brilliant tract of thought and life, carved out of the eternity of time. This is a true experience. I know people who actually had the experience of Sri and at another time of the mother, Literally telling them that whatever you promise will be fulfilled by me. I knew this experience in another context, but I heard this from uh, recently when I went to one of the Odisha places. That once Babaji Maharaj had come, uh, Baba Ramkrishna Das and Champaklalji, and they were all joking around with Babaji Maharaj. Champaklalji was sitting quietly. Then suddenly Champaklalji's stops them and asks for a paper to write. And he writes, you know, the mother has told me to Champaklalji, whatever Babaji says, I will fulfill it. So it's not an ordinary state. It's a very high state of consciousness where the Divine Mother comes down to the Bhakta's level, to that level and says, I will fulfill. Whatever way, whatever your concept of the Divine, he comes and says, okay, I will do this. And it becomes, even when he knows that it, it's like, it's a limitation. Like Sri Krishna and Arjuna, he fulfills. So, we have to go beyond it, but still, you know. I had that experience with Sri Aramindo. But I couldn't quite make out exactly what he said. He said, it seemed like two things. We shall give you all you want, or we shall always care for you. So this goes to the next level, where whatever you promise is fulfilled by God. Yes. It can be to anyone. It is literally giving the power of granting a boon. Yes. Because now it becomes the divine's uh, responsibility to fulfill. I was going to say bounden duty. <laughs> <laughs> she says the words away. <laughs> how dare! <laughs> But that's how the, you know, this world is. A witness to his high triumphant star, her Godhead servitor to a crowned idea. It's her Godhead. She seems to, okay, fine. I'll, I'll do what you want to, want me to do. There are, there is a story in Devi Puran uh, where actually the Divine Mother, because she has promised an Asur Bhakta that I'll defend you whenever you call me. So he calls. And who is against her is Shiva. Because Shiva wants to kill this fellow. And so what she does. She tells Shiva that please. I, I have no choice. Shiva says I also have no choice. So the divine mother swallows Shiva. <laughs> There's such a story like that. If you go through it. It will sound very strange. She knows that this fellow is doing something which is. But she will use everything for evolutionary purposes. That is the supramental vision. But. That is not explained in any of these scriptures because they don't have that total vision. But the crowned idea is yes, so humorous. Crowned idea. <laughs> so she says, all right, if you think like that, so you call a mantra and she comes. She is not bound by anything. She is always there. <clears throat> he shall dominate by her a prostrate world, a warrant for his deeds and his beliefs. She attests his right divine to lead and rule. So they are the masters. I said gurus of two gurus of a high order, whether in the field of Tantra or Vedanta, they are genuine, not what is recognized as gurus. And it's true that they can say something and it is fulfilled because it's a promise they are not making, but the divine takes it upon himself and fulfills it. 
and so naturally the world prostrating because if they start doing this playing displaying this power there would be no end to it <clears throat> last few lines or as a lover clasps his one beloved godhead of his life's worship and desire icon of his heart soul idolatry she now is his and must live for him alone she has invaded him with her sudden bliss an exhaustless marvel in his happy grasp an allurement a caught ravishing miracle so as we can see when we see there are three three all the three yogas find a culmination here but each separately the crowned idea the yoga of knowledge reaches a point where that power comes within the limits of that idea another one is the yoga works that power that's grants whatever he is promises whatever he is dealings with the world she takes upon herself and the bhakti where ultimately you reach a point where you are one with the beloved through that approach which you have taken it may be krishna it may be christ it may be rama it doesn't matter and you discover in that limited way and life becomes a perpetual miracle and yet there is more that we shall explore <laughs> sunday <laughs>